So at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Reed Johnson. He's an assistant professor here in the Department of Entomology, where he studies a lot of honeybee health issues, including pesticide issues with corn dust at uh, planting time. Um, he does a lot of work with pollen identification to see what honeybees are bringing back to the colony. And he's done some looking at rural versus urban beekeeping to see where the advantage is for, uh, for bees and for beekeepers. Today, he'll be presenting honeybee toxicology and overview of pesticides and poisons in the hive. So, Reed, I'll turn the floor over to you. All right, great. Thanks, Denise. Um, so, toxicology is a really interesting topic in relation to honeybees, and hopefully I'll just give you a kind of the, the view from, from 20,000 feet over the course of the next hour or so on, on how toxic things can affect bees and how we can measure the toxicity of different things to bees. And then finally, on how, how that all enters into the, the decision-making and regulatory process about protecting honeybees and other pollinators from, from the poisons they may encounter that are typically man-made. But as you'll see, there are a lot of other toxic things out there that, that bees can become exposed to. So I, I have to start with um, this portrait, which this is a portrait of Paracelsus, who was a, he lived during the Renaissance. He was a true Renaissance man. He was into alchemy and astrology, and he was also the father of the what is the modern science of toxicology. Um, and he he was really the first person to understand how toxic things work. And he, he's essentially the the uh, the Charles Darwin or the Isaac Newton for the field of toxicology, which is why I put his his picture up here. And his key insight was that all things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose permits something not to be poisonous. Or to paraphrase this, this key insight, the dose makes the poison. And this, this may seem like an obvious statement today, but this is really a, a profound understanding in how toxic action works, that, that a, a particular thing could be safe at a low dose, um, but toxic at a high dose. For example, you know, salt, which is quite uh, you know, tolerable in our diet, if you, if you get enough salt, um, you will die. Uh, and the same is true for everything, really. That um, it, it doesn't matter what the compound is, it's really only the dose that determines whether it's, it's safe or poisonous. And this is an idea we're going to come back to again and again, uh, because it, it really is the, the, the cornerstone for the entire field of toxicology and the entire field of pharmacology. There's, there's a lot of research that goes on just based on this, this key insight. So let's just look at some of the toxic things that, uh, that bees could encounter. Uh, because, the, I mean, some of the toxic things are very simple, such as carbon dioxide, a gas that's all around us all the time. Um, carbon dioxide can be toxic to bees. Um, I know I've killed bees with, with carbon dioxide before in some of the work that I've done. It, it has really... Uh, Profound effects on the bee's physiology. It has what, what I guess others would call sublethal effects. It can induce queens to begin laying eggs, and it can. Uh, it also reduces the longevity of workers that are exposed to high concentrations of carbon dioxide. It it causes them to to jump over the the uh, nurse function and go straight to being foragers if they're exposed to high concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, for a while. Of course, carbon dioxide can build up inside a honey beehive, um, and this is something that, that bees have had to deal with for a long time because carbon dioxide has, has always been present. It's always been a, a product of metabolism, and bees have ways of dealing with it so that it doesn't cause undue harm. Bees also have had to deal with toxic compounds in the food that they eat, and they've been doing this for many millions of years as well uh, because you see this pollen, and Denise mentioned that we are interested in, in identifying pollen. This is some you know, the bulk pollen you collect with a pollen trap, and then we sorted out pollen based on color. Well, it turns out that the, the compounds that give this pollen color may actually be toxic. For example, this yellow color here is the yellow of this compound right over here, quercetin, which is a flavonoid. Now, if you were to go to the Sigma Aldrich catalog and buy quercetin, you will see that it comes with this skull and crossbones on the label because quercetin is a toxic compound much more toxic than most insecticides, actually. Um, but it's not toxic because the, to the bees anyway, because the bees have been eating pollen containing quercetin for, for many millions of years. 
and they have enzymes to detoxify this particular compound, so it's not a big deal. Uh, in reality, humans can, are pretty good at detoxifying this as well because it's, it's long been a component in our diet. But as I said before, the dose makes the poison, and if you've got too much quercetin, um, you can kill your bees or yourself, probably. Um, nectar. Of course, bees collect pollen and nectar, and the nectar can contain some toxic compounds as well. Uh, many plants produce what are, what are known as secondary compounds, which are really designed to kill off the the uh, insects that might be feeding on them, not really intended to kill off the bees that might be pollinating them. But these secondary compounds can also get into the nectar. And some of the, the alkaloids that are, are famous for killing insects uh, are caffeine, nicotine, and amygdalin. Um, these are all alkaloids that have toxic activity against many insects. Uh, and they can also appear in the, in the nectar produced by these, um, these plants. Caffeine, of course, is in uh, coffee and uh, citrus, actually. Nicotine is present in the, uh, the tobacco plant and is pre present in the tobacco flower as well. And amygdalin is important because this is the, the toxic alkaloid produced by almonds and is present in almond flowers. However, you, you don't generally hear of bees dying from these because it's um, bees, again, have ways of dealing with the, the alkaloids that are in toxic nectar, and they may not be at, at especially high levels. Interestingly, these can have sublethal effects on bees as well. Bees may learn to prefer toxic nectar that has a little bit of nicotine or caffeine in it. Um, or if it's at especially high concentrations, bees will learn to avoid these alkaloids so they don't poison themselves or the colony. Honey itself may also be toxic. Um, this compound right here is a natural product, natural breakdown product of the, the fructose sugar that is in honey. Um, if you store either honey or high fructose corn syrup in a metallic container under acidic conditions, expose it to heat, the fructose, which bees are able to eat and digest very well, will convert into this particular molecule, hydroxymethyl furfural, which is highly toxic to bees and can, can, uh, can really cause serious problems in bees if they're, they're exposed to high concentrations. Um, this is a, a, an entirely natural process, and it's happening in the honey itself when it's stored in the, in the colony. And old honey, even if it's stored on the comb, can contain high levels of this HMF and may be somewhat toxic to bees. Interestingly, this, this compound is, is not toxic to humans at all, so we have no problem consuming this honey that will hyperproduce corn syrup that's uh, been converted to hydroxymethylferferol, but it is highly toxic to bees. Again, bees uh, have always been exposed to this, probably, and they have uh, ways to deal with it. Um, usually, it's probably by avoidance. Uh, bees also may be exposed to toxins in the hive through that are produced by microorganisms through the spoilage of the, the bee bread in particular. So if you, if you look at bee bread that's been sitting in a, in a dead colony, generally, or in a colony that's not doing well, you'll find that there's mold that begins to grow on the, the bee bread or pollen that the bees store. This mold is almost inevitably an, an, an aspergillus fungus. Um, these are the kinds of fungi that also grow on corn ears. Um, and this, this fungus produces these compounds called aflatoxins. And as you might guess from the name, aflatoxins are highly, highly toxic. Um, these aflatoxins are, they'll, they'll grow on peanuts, they'll grow on corn, and if a human eats too much aflatoxin, it will cause liver failure. And the cure for aflatoxin poisoning is a liver transplant. So it's a pretty serious thing. Um, so don't go eating any of that pollen that might be remaining in a, in a beehive because it could have very potent liver toxins in it. However, bees are remarkably tolerant of aflatoxin. They can eat the stuff fairly without too much trouble because they have the enzymes to break this down. And that's because bees have been, you know, co-evolved with these aflatoxins colonizing the pollen that they're storing in the, in the hive. And uh, they're, they actually tolerate them quite well. So it's not really a problem for, for the bees. It's much more of a problem for us if we go and try to eat the pollen or bee bread that's, that's spoiled by these, uh, these aspergillus fungi. So bees have ways of, of dealing with the toxins, they, natural toxins they encounter. They can detoxify them as they do with the aflatoxins. They can avoid them, as they can do with some of these uh, toxic nectars. They can learn that there's a, a bad consequence for coming into contact with, with a particular toxin. 
And honeybees in particular have the ability to dilute things because, you know, there are tens of thousands of individuals in a colony. And if, if a few of those individuals get into something nasty, it's going to quickly be diluted by all of the other things that the bees are foraging on. So the solution may be dilution for some of these toxins. And, and honeybees can overcome a lot of toxic exposure just by diluting it with clean food that's coming in. So the question is, do these same processes work for modern toxins, the pesticides that humans have invented, modified many of these older toxins in some cases, to kill the, the pests that are a problem for agricultural or structures in, in our modern environment? Well, before we get into the pesticides and their toxicity, we should probably define what a pesticide is. Um, a pesticide is the broadest possible term and it includes all of these things that I'm about to show you. It includes compounds to kill insects, which are called insecticides. It includes compounds to kill weeds, called herbicides. It includes compounds to kill rodents, called rodenticides. Things to kill fungi, called fungicides. Things to kill bacteria and viruses, called antimicrobials, though antimicrobials may be, uh, uh, regulatorily, they're, they're under the uh, purview of the Food and Drug Administration. And mites, um, you have miticides. So all of these things together form the broad class of pesticides. Now beekeepers actually use a variety of pesticides in the, the course of beekeeping. So bees most certainly can tolerate many pesticides in the hive because beekeepers are actively putting them there. Um, beekeepers use drugs and, and pesticides to control American fowl brood. This would be like the, uh, the oxytetracycline and tylosin that beekeepers uh, have historically used to kill uh, AFB vegetative spores anyway. Um, Nosema apis and Nosema serrani can be controlled by the use of fumagillin. These are drugs or pesticides that, that a beekeeper would use to, uh, to control those gut parasites. And most commonly is the pesticides used to control the varroa mite, varroa destructor, which is, is really widely recognized as being the most serious problem in beekeeping today. And pesticides are actually part of the solution um, because they can be very effective at controlling and killing the varroa mite. And there's a whole range of products. Um, some of them are not on the market anymore, but these have been historically used to kill varroa mites, and they, they were effective at one time. Uh, flu fluvalinate, which is the py a pyrethroid insecticide, um, marketed under the name Apistan, has been used. The uh, organophosphate insecticide, Cumafos, uh, has just recently gone off the market, but it was historically used for, uh, for mite control as well as small high beetle control. Uh, Fenproximate, uh, Hyvastan, was on the market for a few years, but it was a, a widely used, moderately widely used uh, miticide at the time. Uh, Apivar, or Amitraz, which is a formamidine insecticide, is really very widely used today because of its, uh, it's very effective at killing varroa mites. Uh, the, the, uh, there are also natural products that beekeepers use to kill varroa mites. The uh, Apolife Var, which is, contains a thymol product, or the Apigard. And then the organic acids, which are natural products, but are being used as a pesticide in this case, oxalic acid and formic acid. And of course, the hops beta acids um, in hop guard, which also are natural products, but have efficacy against uh, varroa mites as well. So a whole range of pesticides that beekeepers are using to control varroa mites in, uh, in the bee colony. And they are used relatively safely. It seems to be, seems to be, even though they're used at, at really astonishingly high levels in a beehive. These are the, the uh, grams of active ingredient in each of these different treatments. Um, if you get Apivar, you're actually putting one gram of a formamidine uh, insecticide, really, into the colony. 2.5 grams of organophosphate with checkmite. These are not small, not small quantities of pesticide that are going into a hive when a beekeeper is treating for varroa mites. And it's always been fascinating to me that, bee, that, that honeybees can tolerate this kind of exposure to what, what would otherwise seem to be, you know, really dangerous classes of insecticides. And not only do the bees survive it, they may well be better for the exposure because this kills the varroa mites that are causing them so much problem. So this is really a fundamental, you know, really fundamentally interesting toxicological question here is how do bees tolerate this kind of exposure to these drugs? Well, you gotta go back to 
our hero, Paracelsus, who tells us that the dose makes the poison. And this kind of situation is not totally unique to bees. This is really the foundation of the entire pharmaceutical industry, is that they find compounds that can be maybe deadly at some level, but are therapeutic at another level. So a good example of this kind of situation would be with... Um, with uh, warfarin bait or warfarin uh, rat poison, essentially. This is a compound that is highly toxic to mammals. It causes um, thinning of the blood and will cause rats to bleed internally, um, which eventually kills them if they consume uh, this warfarin. However, the exact same molecule at a much lower concentration is marketed under the trade name Coumadin, um, which also contains warfarin. You can see it right there. And this is used as a blood thinner to prevent, um, you know, the, the clogging of, uh, you know, people that have had strokes to prevent them from uh, for ha having another stroke by keeping the blood thin. Uh, my grandmother actually takes Coumadin, uh, which is exactly the same molecule as warfarin, uh, rat poison. So, I mean, while you could attempt to save some money, you could go buy some rat poison and attempt to save some money by by dividing it up very carefully into the quantity that could potentially be therapeutic, uh, there's some serious problems with that because you want to make sure that you have the right dose when you're dealing with these poisons so that you want to have a therapeutic dose and not a deadly dose. Exactly the same thing is true with the miticides. So it's entirely possible for a beekeeper to go out and, and buy you know, a Maverick product, which is a contains exactly the same active ingredient as Apistan, and they could make kind of a homebrew uh, apis or apistan-like treatment. Um, but again, you need to make sure that you're, you've got your dosage correct and that you're actually going to, to be up here in the deadly zone with the rats as opposed to down here in the therapeutic zone uh, where you have drugs. Which brings us to the topic of how do we determine what is a safe dose and what is a toxic dose? Because if the dose makes the poison, how do you determine what dose is tolerable and what dose is not tolerable. Well, this gets back to some, some really basic um, toxicology statistics, which I'm going to just introduce you to here, which is the lethal dose 50% or LD50. And this is a, a really nice number that you can use to determine where is safe and where is toxic when you're talking about any particular compound. This is incredibly useful in looking at the toxicity of different insecticides to bees, as well as just kind of giving you a general sense of how toxic something is and where that line between therapeutic and deadly is. So I'm just going to show you how I do these uh, LD50 bioassays to give you a sense for what an LD50 really means. And these are these. We just started our our first bioassays yesterday for the spring. Uh, of 2016, and this is exactly what we do here in the lab to determine these LD50s. So first thing, you need bees. And we here we've got a bunch of bees in a cage uh, inside our incubator. We give them some sugar syrup. These, these bees are about three days old. Um, we, we collect brood from a, a healthy colony, uh, allow that brood to, the adults to emerge from that brood in our incubator, age those adults for three to four days, and then put them in those, inside those, those containers that I just showed you. And then we divide these, this group of bees up into little groups of about 20 bees, and each group of, of bees will receive a different dose of pesticide. We've got one group here receiving a low dose, medium dose, high dose. Um, and we, we give them that dose of pesticide uh, with this little syringe, and we put one microliter of insecticide on the bees' thorax right there. These bees have incidentally been knocked out with carbon dioxide so they can't fly away. And then we, here are these different groups that we've, we've divided up and applied insecticide to, and we've got you know, control here, low, medium, all the way up to a high dose. Um, incidentally, these are little ice cream cups that we keep the bees in, and you can see that we're feeding them with, with sugar water so they don't starve to death. And then we just come back 24 hours later, and we count the number of bees that have died in each group. And you would expect in the, in the low dose group, you have only a few bees have died. In the medium dose group here, we've got you know, maybe half the bees have died. And in the high dose group, presumably all of the bees have died. And we just need to count those numbers and determine, you know, over the over these different treatments, how many bees have died. 
Now we can take these data and we can plot them on a, on a chart here. And on the y-axis, we have the percent of bees that have died in each of these treatment groups. And on the x-axis here, we have the dose of insecticide in micrograms. And this is a log scale here, um, but don't let that alarm you. It, it actually makes things fit easier and makes it easier to understand. And we've got, you know, as a low dose here, we have low mortality. And as we increase the dose, we get higher and higher mortality. And you can see how this kind of lines up along a line. Well, you can fit a mathematical um, equation to this, and you can actually get a, a line fit. Um, and this is the first step into getting an LD50. And then you can compare the toxicity of this particular insecticide, talfuvalinate, this is the active ingredient in, uh, in apistan strips, to another pyrethroid insecticide, bifenthrin. This is a, a widely used insecticide to kill you know, pest insects. Um, and you can see there's a, a pretty big difference between these two insecticides. Um, and their curves are, and these lines that you fit are different. Um, how do we actually express this difference in a number? Well, you can do that by drawing a line through here at 50%, and then drawing a line down here to look at the dose that you would expect to cause 50% mortality for each of the two different insecticides. And for bifenthrin, the LD50 is 0 0.01 micrograms per B, and for talfuvalinate, the LD50 is 10 micrograms per B. And so now we've put a number on this curve that we can use to compare. We can, we can say that, well, very clearly, bifenthrin is much more toxic to bees than talfuvalinate is. And this is probably the reason that, you know, these are very closely related compounds, but you can use talfuvalinate to kill varroa mites in a bee colony. You can't use bifenthrin to kill varroa mites in a bee colony because you're going to kill the bees first, probably before you even kill the varroa mites. Um, and now we have a nice number to express this you know, thousand-fold difference in the toxicity of these two different compounds. So these LD50s are really a, the foundation of how we go about talking about insecticide toxicity to bees. And there's an incredibly wide variability in insecticide toxicity to bees as measured by this LD50. Some pesticides have very low toxicity and can safely be used in the, in the beehive, like talfuvalinate. Others have extremely high toxicity and really should never be used anywhere bees will come into contact with them, such as bifenthrin. This LD50 is really useful for comparing the toxicity. This is what the, the foundation for making these statements. And you can actually, uh, as part of the standard registration procedure for any pesticide, um, be that insecticide, fungicide, herbicide, there are LD50s determined for honeybees, and those LD50s are available at the uh, EPA Ecotox database. And you can access this database through the, uh, the EPA's website here, and you can look up the, the honeybee LD50 for essentially every insecticide, fungicide, herbicide that has ever been on the market um, because it's a standard part of the registration package. Um, so this, you can go there, and, and I don't know, I, I, a site I enjoy looking at, it's a little bit not very user-friendly, but it's got some really good information there. So this, is, um, this has really been the foundation for understanding bee toxicity of pesticides for the last 40 years, is these lab LD50 tests. They have some very clear advantages. LD50s are reliable and straightforward to compare. You can do them, you know, treat bees topically, contact, or feed them um, pesticides to look at the LD50s. You can do these on adults or larvae. And you can do them on all casts of bees, workers, queens, and drones. It's, it's remarkably flexible what you can do them on. Now, the, diff the, the, the clear disadvantage of this kind of lab LD50 testing is that it does not test colony level effects. So bees, obviously honeybees, do not exist as individuals. They exist as colonies. And uh, an individual level test can maybe give you some insight into the toxicity of a, of a particular compound to bees in a colony, but it's not the same thing as testing the effects of a compound on bees in a colony, because there's a lot of other things going on there um, that might mitigate the toxicity or might exacerbate the toxicity. It's, it's really difficult to know. Uh, additionally, lab LD50 tests are really not very good for detecting long-term or sublethal effects because you have to have mortality 
lethal is a part of the name of an LD50, um, and they, they're not designed to test for sublethal effects. Though you could run them for longer and maybe look at the chronic mortality. So the LD50 uh, goes into this risk equation that you would use if you're looking at the risk that a particular pesticide or even a, a natural product poses to bees. Um, so this is the, the risk equation here. Risk equals hazard times exposure. So the hazard we've already dealt with. The hazard we're going to express as the LD50. And this is just the toxicity that a particular compound shows towards bees. And we have a nice way of measuring that with the LD50. Now, however, it, it really doesn't matter how toxic something is if a bee never gets exposed to it. So if it's a... Uh, you know, a compound that's only used in structures to control, you know, bed bugs or something, and, you know, bees are not ever going to come into contact with a, a person's mattress or anything. So the exposure, even though it may have very high toxicity to bees, this compound may, if it's only ever used on mattresses, um, it, it poses essentially zero risk to bees because bees have zero exposure. This gets back to Paracelsus and his... his um, his insight that it's the dose that makes the poison. If the dose is zero, it doesn't matter how toxic it is, the risk is also going to be zero. Um, so there's a lot of different things that will determine what the exposure bees get is going to be. Um, the formulation of a particular pesticide, the function, and the label restrictions and laws. So there's a lot of things that can, can really change the exposure that bees will receive to a different pesticide, regardless of how toxic it actually is to the bees. But you really need to look at both of these in order to understand the risk that is posed by any particular pesticide to, to bees in, in actual use. And here we, we should probably look at the, the language that really governs EPA's um, assessment of risk to bees and what they're trying to protect. So all of this stems from the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, which is originally passed back in 1947. It was then revised in 1972, 1988, and most recently revised with the Food Quality Protection Act of 1996. But all of this has this, this same language in it. Is, is EPA, or the agencies that came before it, need to guard against unreasonable adverse effects on the environment. And this has been construed to include honeybees. You don't want to have a, a pesticide out there that has an unreasonable adverse effect on honeybees. Now, this is a little bit nuanced language here. What, so what exactly is an unreasonable adverse effect? This is not saying that there can be no effect on honeybees at all. This is saying that it has to not be unreasonable and adverse, which has a lot more, is a much broader more difficult to define statement. And in reality, EPA is, has to do a risk analysis of the environmental effects that includes a cost-benefit analysis of every pesticide use and its effect on bees. So it's entirely possible that after a risk-benefit analysis is done, if a, a pesticide has such profound beneficial uh, effects on, on society, that, that that huge benefit may outweigh a moderate cost to honeybees. So it is possible for pesticides to be used in a manner that causes harm to bees in the United States. And that is entirely within the limits of the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act if the cost-benefit analysis um, says that, you know, if, if, if their analysis says that the benefit outweighs the cost to bees, Bees can get the short end of the stick, and that is allowable under current, current law. This is very different from the approach that they take in the European Union, which is why you know, uh, neonicotinoid insecticides have been banned in some uses in the European Union, but they have not been banned in the United States because the, the European Union takes a very different approach to this kind of risk to bees. They have a precautionary principle, which is much more uh, conservative, really, and doesn't necessarily take into account this cost-benefit analysis that, that, that by law 
EPA is required to do, and that's that's required to be the standard of their decision, the, the standard for their decision, decision making. So how do they decide um, whether you know something is going to kill bees? Well, they've got a, a very nice numerical way that they have done this historically, and this has been the way that, that bee toxicity bee toxicity has been assessed for the last 40 years or so. And that's this risk quotient based approach. And this is, you just take, first off, you have that LD50 for a particular compound that goes in the uh, denominator of your equation here. And then you have the exposure, and this is the, the application rate at which a pesticide would be applied. And that would be in pounds of active ingredient per acre. You divide the exposure by the LD50, and that gives you this risk quotient, which is kind of a, a uh, unitless number that they use to determine the, you know, the the hazard, the risk that, that a particular application might pose to bees. And this becomes an issue if this RQ is greater than 0 0.4. At that point, it has reached the level of concern, and there's a high likelihood that this application would cause um, unreasonable adverse effects to bees. And as long as you can keep this below 0 0.4, historically that's reduced bee mortality to 10% or less. And that's uh, over the last 40 years of, of work that's been done um, shows that as long as the RQ is less than or is is uh, less than 0 0.4, you can reduce bee mortality. So this is a little esoteric, but this is really how the the nuts and bolts of this whole risk assessment process work. And if you're, you're interested in this, it's actually gotten a lot more complicated recently, but this is still the fundamental basis for how it's determined whether a, a pesticide application is likely to cause harm to bees or not, and how they meet that unreasonable uh, adverse effects standard. Well, it turns out that you know there are a lot of insecticides out there that have gone through this whole process. This is the universe of insecticides. This is the uh, the Iraq poster, which has all the different modes of action that insecticides use. Um, really fascinating to look at if you're into insect insecticide toxicology, as I am. Maybe not so interesting if you're not into that kind of thing, but I, th I think it's fascinating. Um, and so we'll just take kind of a, a quick tour through the different insecticides just to kind of give you an overview of all the insecticides that are out there, all different classes of insecticides and their relative toxicity to bees and humans where that's appropriate. So one of the older classes of insecticides that is still in use is the organophosphates. These achieved widespread use back in the 1960s. Um, these are nerve poisons. They have the distinct disadvantage of being relatively highly toxic to humans. And they have a whole range of toxicity to bees. They have, uh, here's chlorpyrifos, which is one that's still in use. Its LD50 is 0 0.059, which is highly toxic. Malathion, another one that's relatively widely used, has a, a moderately uh, toxic LD50 as well. And then you have checkmite. Kumafos. This is the stuff that was used in beehives for many years to kill varroa mites, and its LD50 is much higher. It has a much lower toxicity to bees and can very safely be used when bees are around. In fact, it's used directly in bee colonies. That's how safe it is. Another class of, of insecticides, the carbamates. These are also um, nerve poisons related uh, in their mode of action to the organophosphates I just showed you a moment ago. These also have some toxicity to humans. Um, and some toxicity to bees. In general, they're a little bit less toxic to bees. So here's Temic, which contains aldicarb, has a, uh, a relatively low LD50, high toxicity to bees. Uh, Carboreal, which is in that seven dust, which is on every hardware store shelf in the country, is actually moderately toxic to bees. Um, and then there's, there's this carbamate larvin, contains thiodiocarb, which is of low toxicity to bees. So you have the whole, you know, Carbamates have the whole range of toxicity to bees as well. The pyrethroids. Um, this is a, a class that's in very widespread use now. Um, these are also nerve poisons. These are based on a natural product that is in chrysanthemums. Um, relatively safe for humans. They have some repellent activity on bees, so bees are less likely to become exposed to them because they're repelled by them. But if they do come into contact with them, they, they, they can show very high toxicity uh, just by touching. And some compounds that are, are in this pyrethroid class include something like Ortho Home Defense Max, which contains bifenthrin. This is that insecticide I showed you with that LD50 
uh, chart a, a few minutes ago, it has a, a very low LD50, extremely toxic to bees. Um, you've also got pyrethrum 5EC. Uh, this is actually an organic approved insecticide. This is actually derived from chrysanthemums. Note, however, that the, the LD50 of this organic approved insecticide is essentially the same as the LB50 of this synthetic insecticide. Bifenthrin and pyrethrum have very similar toxicity to bees. LB50 of 0 0.02, very, very highly toxic to bees. So just because something is natural or because it's organic does not have any bearing on its safety to bees because there are natural and organic things that can be highly toxic to bees as well. And there's no way you should be using this stuff around bees under any circumstances, despite its organic status. And then of course you have something like fluvalinate, again, a synthetic pyrethroid, but it has very low toxicity to bees. This is the active ingredient in apistan, which I showed you a, a few minutes ago. Uh, then there are the neonicotinoids, and these are the ones people always like to talk about. Um, they're a very popular class of insecticide at the moment. These are also nerve toxins. Uh, they are analogs of nicotine, just as you know, the pyrethroids are kind of uh, modifications of chrysanthemum poisons. The neonicotinoids are modifications of tobacco poisons. Um, and these are have the advantage of that they've, they've been designed to be relatively safe to humans. So we've got a product like imidacloprid, which has a very low LD50, high toxicity to bees. This is the stuff that's in Bayer Advanced, for example. Um, you've got dinotefiran, which is in uh, something like Safari also very highly toxic to bees. However, not all neonicotinoids are highly toxic to bees. There's uh, this product, acetamiprid, which is used in a sale. This is a product that's actually widely used on uh, in apples. Um, well, acetamiprid is, I don't know if a sale is or not. It has very low toxicity to bees. I mean, if this had, this has the characteristics of something that could be used in the hive to control varroa mites, if it was actually effective against varroa mites. Um, very low toxicity to bees. So it's, it's really untrue to say that all neonicotinoids are highly toxic to bees because there are clearly some neonicotinoids that are not. Um, you really just have to look at the particular compound in question to determine whether something is toxic or not toxic to bees. So here's uh, the new relatives of neonicotinoids. This is the uh, Sivanto from Bayer. Um, they don't call them neonicotinoids. You, I guess, could call them neo-neonicotinoids. Uh, this one is actually, oh, they got another name for it, but uh, flupyratiferone is a, essentially a neonicotinoid that has really astonishingly low toxicity to bees. And, and this is really a sign that the companies have, have listened and are beginning to bring to market insecticides that are have low intrinsic toxicity to bees. So this is really promising development, I think. Um, and then, but it's not always the case. This uh, sulfoxifor, uh, marketed by Dow, even though it's currently off the market uh, in Transform, has relatively, it has moderate toxicity to bees. It's not as toxic as some compounds, but it, it does show relatively high toxicity. Um, then there's this newest class of compounds, and these are really just starting to show up in the homeowner market. I, I finally saw a compound at the uh, at Lowe's this a couple weeks ago that contains some of these compounds, uh, the diamides. These are nerve and muscle poisons. Uh, they're, they're, they have contact toxicity. Again, they're relatively safe for humans, which is the reason these are new compounds. They're replacing some of the older organophosphates and other compounds. Uh, and generally, they're, they're safe for bees. So you have Lumivia or Altacor is another name for this one. Uh, contains the active ingredient chloroternilaprol. Very safe for bees, actually. It has a very low acute toxicity. Um, flubendiamide, which is in belt. Um, this one is just being pulled off the market for, for reasons unrelated to bees. Um, but it, it's too bad because it has, actually has low toxicity to bees. From a, from a bee perspective, it's, it's a pretty good one. However, just as I was about to say that the diamides in general are safe for bees, um, DuPont went and came out with this uh, Ciazepir or Cyantranilaprol which actually shows relatively high toxicity to bees, which just kind of proves the point that you can't judge an insecticide just by knowing which class it's in, whether it's a diamide or a neonicotinoid. 
you have to know the actual active ingredient because there's incredible diversity in the toxicity of these different active ingredients to bees. And that's just true across the board. There's lots of other insecticides out there. I put up that, that chart with lots of little um, honeycomb shaped cells in there with lots of different insecticides. There's insect growth regulators, energy metabolism modulators, lipid synthesis inhibitors. Same story is true for all of these. You, you need to look at them. Um, some of them may be safer for bees than others. Um, in any case, it's better if they're not used around bees because any insecticide used around bees has the potential. I mean, these things are insecticides. They're designed to kill insects. And there's potential, even if the LD50 looks relatively safe, there's still the potential for, for harm to bees through other means. For example, these insect growth regulators have very low toxicity to adult bees. But that's because their toxicity is in development. They kill developing bees or developing insects in general, and you wouldn't expect them to have any effect on adults. So you really would need to look at the brood toxicity to, uh, to effectively assess the toxicity of the IGRs to, to bees. Lots of other pesticides out there in the broader category of pesticides, such as the fungicides. That, um, these, these generally, actually universally, have a low toxicity to bees because the LD50s are all greater than 10 micrograms per bee. And that's because bees aren't fungus. Um, these things are not designed to kill insects. And in general, they don't kill insects well at all. Um, the problem, however, is that because they don't kill bees, there's no label language that prohibits their application during bloom. And they could be applied to blooming trees when bees are, are actively foraging. And the result is that very high exposure is possible to some of these fungicides if they're used during bloom. And they can be found in very high concentrations in pollen that bees collect uh, when they are applied during bloom. It may have effects on brood and other things as well. Uh, this is an area of, of ongoing research. Herbicides are probably even less of a concern uh, for bee toxicity. These are almost impossible to kill bees with. Um, use very high concentrations. The real problem with the herbicides is that they kill the quote unquote weeds um, that are flowering that bees need to feed upon. Um, so they, herbicides are quite capable of killing bees, but it's not through direct toxicity. It's through killing the food that bees need to feed upon. So uh, herbicide direct toxicity is really, I don't think, a concern, but I still would like to see fewer herbicides used just because I would like to see more weeds growing out there in the environment for bees. Um, I guess that's just my own personal viewpoint on on weeds, I'm sure other people have different opinions of the dandelions that are growing in their yard. Um, so then there's the question of interactions, because it's rare that a bee would be exposed to just one insecticide or fungicide by itself. Often they're tank mixed uh, together. And there's been a great deal of re work done on this in a human context, looking at the bee toxicology, um, or at, at human toxicology. So what we really need to do is make the bees pharmacy guide to deadly drug interactions. And we've got about two pages into this. I've done some work on the interaction between varroacides for controlling varroa mite and some of the fungicides, uh, but it's, we've got a long way to go here. The key thing here is that uh, the, are the cytochrome P450 monooxygenases detoxify a lot of different compounds in bees. This is probably what bees use to tolerate the quercetin that they're being exposed to in the pollen that they consume. This is what bees are using to tolerate the, the fluvalinate that's in that apistan treatment beekeepers use to control varroa mites. So you have a bee safe insecticide or a, a natural toxin that's bee safe and the bees are detoxifying it with the cytochrome P450 monooxygenases. However, if you apply uh, a fungicide in this sterile biosynthesis inhibiting fungicide class, which are specifically designed to inhibit P450 activity, it will stop up this enzyme and make it so that um, the bees can't tolerate this bee safe insecticide anymore because they're no longer able to metabolize it. And this, if, if this combination is applied, you can take what was a bee safe insecticide and turn it into a bee toxic insecticide if it's in combination with a, uh, a fungicide of this class. 
So getting back to this risk equation, we have the hazard, which we are calculating as the LD50. And I've shown you lots of LD50s now. You got a clear sense that there's a broad diversity of toxicities out there to bees. And then the exposure, which is, is determined by formulation, function, and label restrictions and laws. And we'll just get into the exposure here now, the exposure side of this equation in the last couple of minutes. So bees can be exposed to insecticides or, or pesticides or toxins in many, many different ways. They can be exposed through deposition on flowering plants, through expression of systemic insecticides in pollen and nectar, deposition while flying, uh, migration through the soil, drift and exposure through weeds, through dust, or through bees returning to the colony. Many different ways for bees to be exposed to pesticides out in the environment. The formulation of an insecticide really determines how a bee will be exposed to it. And formulations can be better or worse, uh, depending on, on the particular formulation. So the best, from a bee perspective, are like impregnated materials or seed treatments, which bees really don't come into contact with at all under most circumstances. Uh, baits are also relatively good. Granular insecticides are, are relatively good as well because they are in particles on the ground that bees don't pick up those granules. Concentrates or sprays become a little more hazardous. Uh, wettable powders, more hazardous still. Dusts are pretty bad. And the worst of all are these microencapsulated uh, insecticides or pesticides that, that um, have dust-like characteristics. The reason dusts are so bad is because these, uh, these dusts stick to the bees and can get transported back to the colony where a bee will essentially poison a lot of other bees inside the colony. But the formulation goes a long way towards determining whether something is safe or hazardous for bees. Systemicity determines exposure, and you know the neonicotinoids are famous for this, for having the systemic uh, activity. They get into the fluids of the plant and can be expressed in the pollen and nectar. One place where this might be a real concern is in the gutation water of, of uh, corn plants, where there may actually be enough insecticide there to, to kill bees. Less of an issue in the pollen, uh, because there's much lower concentrations uh, by the time the pollen is shed in corn plants. The crop type determines the exposure as well. Um, some, some crops are attracted to bees, others are not. So this is just the use of imidacloprid in the different crops in the U.S. We've got the estimated use in pounds here on the y-axis and the years on the x-axis here. And you see that there's, you know, imidacloprid is used in all different manner of crops. Um, some of them are more or less concerning. Um, wheat, not so much of a problem. Cotton, however, is more of an issue because bees most definitely do visit cotton. Bees also visit soybeans. So it depends on what crop it is, um, whether the bees are likely to be attracted to it or not. And finally, probably the most important thing is label restrictions determine bee exposure because the product of that whole risk assessment process I, I mentioned previously is to determine what kind of language and what kind of restrictions end up on a particular insecticide label. So here we've got the label for bifenthrin, which as we have mentioned before, is highly toxic to bees. And if you look at the environmental hazard statement on this label, you'll see that it says protection of livestock, dangerous to bees. Do not spray any plants in flower when bees are foraging. Spray in the early morning when bees are not actively foraging. So this means that it's actually illegal for a pesticide applicator to use this in a manner not consistent with this language. Now, you could argue that this is not actually that the protection here is not great because they're still allowed to spray in the early morning when bees are not actively foraging, but they're not allowed to spray it during the middle of the day when bees are most certainly actively foraging. So that's some level of protection. Um, and I, th I think there's a lot of room for improvement on these environmental hazard statements, but they do limit when and where a particular pesticide or insecticide in particular can be used to protect bees from its toxicity. Now, if you have any questions about a particular insecticide that you hear is about to be used, I'd encourage you to go, um, I, I also, the application rate determines bee exposure, and you can look at the rate just by looking at the, uh, the label as well for the particular crop that it's to be applied to. And the rate actually goes into that risk assessment equation that I showed you earlier. And obviously, if you have less being applied, uh, you're going to have a lower toxicity to bees because the dose makes the poison. So if you ever want to look up these labels, and I, I don't think beekeepers look at labels nearly enough, you need to go to the CDMS website here, 
uh, just cdms.net, and they have all the labels for all the insecticides and pesticides that are in active use today. You can just put in the brand name of the insecticide that you hear is going to be applied in this CDMS website, and you can, you know, look up, you know, if we put in Warrior here, you want to see here Warrior is going to be sprayed on soybeans, go look up Warrior 2 with Xeon technology, and then you look at the uh, specimen label here, and you can actually get um, the label, and you can look at the environmental hazard statement on this label and the use rate and see, you know, just how toxic is Lambda Cyhalothrin to bees. And is this something that you should really be worried about if you hear that it's about to be applied to soybeans? And you look here on the environmental hazard statement, and it says, this product is highly toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment or residues on blooming crops or weeds. Do not apply this product or allow it to drift to blooming crops or weeds if bees are visiting the treatment area. So yes, applying this to soybeans during bloom um, is probably something you as a beekeeper should be concerned about. But you wouldn't have known that unless you'd actually gone to look at the label. Because it's really hard to, to assess toxicity uh, any other way. Um, EPA has got these new bee advisory boxes that are starting to show up on labels as well that really help to emphasize the toxicity that a particular compound may show to bees. Um, so if an applicator sees this uh, bee icon, um, that should indicate to them that, that the product they're about to use is especially toxic to bees and they need to really avoid drift and really look at the label to determine when and where they can use it and communicate with beekeepers in the area to help protect bees from exposure. Um, so currently it's the neonicotinoids that, that carry this label, the highly toxic neonicotinoids, the, the relatively bee safe neonicotinoids do not carry this label. Um, and it carries applications or limits to application during blooming and when bees are foraging. Um, basically the same stuff that was already on the label, but this icon hopefully gives it a new importance in the, in the eyes of the people using these products. So there are big changes afoot in the way that uh, bee toxicity is, is assessed. So in the old days, for the last 40 years, the goal of that whole process that I showed you, this RQ uh, that is calculated, this, uh, this quotient, was really to, to stop this kind of, of problem here. This was a, uh, an application in citrus, probably back during the 1970s, um, and only three of 120 colonies survived in this particular situation. And you can just see the blanket of dead bees on the ground here. Um, this is a, really a horrible bee kill. This was unacceptable back in the 1970s. This would be front page news in 2016 if this kind of thing happened. Um, and, I mean, there are fewer of these bee kills that occur, so I think things are moving in the right direction. The problem is you can, you can harm colonies like this without causing this kind of spectacular bee kill. So the old goal was to stop bee kills. The new goal is to make sure that these colonies are healthy and productive. So here are the new pollinator protection goals that go, go beyond just stopping those bee kills. We want to protect the delivery of pollination services. We want to protect the production of honey and hive products, and we want to protect the biodiversity of pollinators. These are all excellent goals, um, but they're a lot more challenging to achieve than simply not killing large numbers of bees, um, because this, this is a much more nuanced thing that we need to, to look at. And how do we know whether a particular pesticide application has any effect on you know, the amount of honey pro a particular colony is producing? It's, it's much more challenging. So the next 20 years will probably be spent determining how this will, um, will play out and how we can use pesticides in a way that, that minimizes the effect on these things that we care about that bees and other pollinators provide. And there's lots of new testing that, uh, that new pesticides need to go through as new pesticides come onto the market and old pesticides are re-registered the amount of testing required is vastly, vastly more comprehensive, looking at larval toxicity, looking at semi-field trials, and in some cases going to full field trials. So it's a really good time to be in the bee testing business if you're a regulatory toxicology lab. Lots of testing to be done of pesticides. So in summary, um, Bees have always been exposed to toxic compounds. As I, I, I started off with, there's a lot of toxic compounds produced by plants in the environment, and bees have been exposed to these for, for millions of years, and they have ways to deal with them. 
you need, as Paracelsus tells us, you need both exposure and toxicity if you're going to kill bees. You're going to cause harm to bees. Insecticides are generally the riskiest pesticides for bees for the reason that they're designed and intended to kill insects. And I think beekeepers should keep their focus on insecticides first and fungicides and other things second. Formulation, rate, timing of exposure, or timing of application will limit bees exposure. And the pesticide risk assessment landscape and how it, it uses all of these different things is really changing rapidly right now. And it's, we're really at a, a new moment in how we determine whether and how pesticides are, are toxic to bees and how we can help to reduce the harm that pesticide use causes to bees in, uh, in the world around us.